And there's also another empty seat over there. And there. I should take a roll today. <laughs> now that you're here. And he's here. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, well, you know, it happens. Okay, assuming x is an integer, is there any way to simplify this? Okay, well, let's see. K is greater than zero, probably cannot be simplified anymore, so we have to keep that one the way it is. How about x minus one is greater than or equal to zero? If I know that x is an integer, can I just say that? It is the same as saying x is greater than or equal to one if I know that x is already an integer, okay? What about the last part? Can, instead of saying x minus one is less than k, can I say that x is less than or equal to k, knowing that x is an integer to begin with? I cannot do this. I cannot make this equivalent to this, not knowing that x is an integer. But now that I know that x has to be an integer, this translation has to work. Okay. Are we okay so far? <laughs> you guys, can, can you concentrate? Okay. Good. Yeah. How do we know that x is an integer? Um, in programming, a lot of times you can restrict the type of a variable. In other words, in C and C++ programming particularly, when you use a variable, you have to indicate the type of the variable. So by the time you get to this statement here, the program would have restricted you know, the type of x. So by this time, we would have known, can we do this translation? Because we would have known whether x is an integer or not. But this, this does not apply to scripting languages, because in scripting languages, there's no such thing as a type. So x can be a number, can be a string, can be a real number, can be an integer, depending on how it is used. Okay, okay so now that we have post 1 or pre 2, we can try to work out what is pre 3. What do you think is pre 3, looking at this, this statement here? I don't care what statement three is. Pre three is simply saying, what do we know about the variables right before line three starts to execute? What do you guys think? We don't have to spell out all the details yet. Can someone you know, kind of express it in pre and post conditions of other stuff first? Go ahead. Uh, pre two and x is going to be okay. Yep, very good. Okay. I can keep pre two in pre three because line two does not have a chance to change any variable. In other words, whatever is true on line two or before line two still has to be true right before line three executes because I didn't have a chance to change anything. But on top of that, the fact that we are about to execute line three means that the condition has to be true. Okay, so that's why we can add and say x has to be greater than or equal to k. Very good. Now we can expand this. What is pre2? Pre2 is this big mess here. So we just paste it here. And then we, exp we also add x is greater than or equal to k. There isn't much that we can do about k is greater than 0. It has to stay here. Um, x is greater than 0. Maybe we can do something about it, but we'll do it. We'll do something about it later. Go ahead. I'm having a hard time understanding the previous line. If x is less than equal to k and x is greater than equal to k, mm -hmm. is, is x equal k? Is that what it says? Yep, it simplifies to x equals k. Yep, very good. Just like that. Very good. Does everybody see why we can simplify this conjunction here? x is less than or equal to k, and x is greater than or equal to k, why we can simplify that to x equals k? Yep, that's the only way to make both of them true. In other words, you know, every time you look at a conjunction, you're looking at an intersection of the numbers. We have one set of numbers here, we have another set of numbers here. The intersection between these two is just one single value when x does equal to k. So that's why we can do this simplification. Okay, very good. Um, now that we know pre-3, can we derive post-3? Sure. 
right? I mean, it's pretty easy to derive po post three. Um, same approach. So what we need to do is to do the same thing here. The right hand side refers to the left hand side on line three. X plus k, x minus k is re, x minus k refers to x. The right hand side has an inverse. Okay, because if g of x is defined as x minus k, then g prime of x is defined as, as x plus k. Is that okay? All right. So now we know that we can apply the substitution rule. So we can apply the substitution rule, which means if I want to get to post 3, I can say post 3 is the result of a substitution operation. We start with the precondition of line 3. We find all occurrences of the variable on the left hand side, which in this case is x, and replace every single one of these with the inverse function g prime applied to x. Is that part okay? I'm hoping that you guys are starting to see that this is a fairly mechanical process. Okay, we check this is true, we check this is true, we can apply the substitution operation, but all substitution operation starts with the precondition of that line. We substitute, we apply all the occurrences of the variable on the left hand side of the assignment statement and replace every single one of those with the inverse function of the right hand side applied to the same variable. So I'm hoping that you guys can see that this is a template. It is completely mechanical. The only part that is not mechanical, that is kind of tricky if you have to spend some time, is to figure out the inverse function. That's the only part that depends on the specific line that you're dealing with. But everything else should be fairly mechanical. Okay. So now that we know this is you know, mechanical, we can just you know, substitute or expand pre-3 inside the substitution operation. So it is easy for me to do because I can do copy and paste. And then we have x here, and then the other one is x plus k as the inverse function. So mm, what do we do here? Well, we just go ahead and do the substitution. k is greater than 0, does not mention x at all, nothing to do. x does mention x, so we, it becomes x plus k is greater than 0. And then the other one is x equals k. So x equals k becomes x plus k equals k. Like that. Okay? Are you guys okay with the substitution operation? This has nothing to do with derivation or simplification. I see x, I put in x plus k. I see x, I put in x plus k. The next step is interesting. Because the next step is to do a little bit of simplification, and we'll see what happens with this simplification. K is greater than 0. Nothing we can do about this. This one is saying that x is greater than negative k, because I can, do a subtract, I can subtract k from both sides and arrive to this conclusion. And this one is even better, because it is, if you simplify this, it becomes what? x equals 0. Can we simplify this a little bit more? I mean, there's nothing conflicting here, okay? In other words, k is greater than zero does not conflict with the other two conditions. x is greater than negative k does not conflict with these two conditions. x equals zero still does not conflict with any of the other two conditions. But we can simplify. Go ahead. How did you x equals zero? K. Because x plus k equals k. Okay. You subtract k from both sides of the equation, then you get x equals to zero. Okay, so it's a simplification of this guy here. But if k is positive, I know k is greater than 0, and I know that x equals to 0, that already implies that x is greater than negative k. I don't need to say that. Okay, I really don't need this one here. It does not add any new information. It does not add any restrictions to the condition. It's just sitting there doing nothing. So that means if I want to be clean about this, I would do this. I would actually just say that because the other condition, x is greater than negative k, is useless. If you look at it from a set theory perspective, x equals to 0 is a single dot. 
But that single dot is contained within x is greater than negative k and k is greater than zero because that basically gives you all the you know, positive number, zero, and all the negative numbers up to but excluding negative k. So whenever you have a, you know, a set that is a superset, a single dot, and the single dot is within the superset and you're trying to find the intersection because it's a conjunction, you can just mention the single dot because the other, the bigger one is useless. Okay, all right. So that's good, post three is all done. Ah, but, he, but the main question here is what is post four? Now, in order to figure out what is post four, let's look at the picture again. Because if you look at this picture here, um, we have this one being pre two, right? Pre two is the condition right before we get into the conditional statement, which is right at this point. We do the branch. This part here is equivalent to what? Pre three, which is you know taking the true branch, but before we perform the operation. This part here is our post three because it is the condition that is true after we perform statement three. But I'm asking the question, what is post four here? How many ways do we have to get to this point here at post four? We've got two ways to go there. One way is to go through the then block, which means post three is going to be true. What about the other way? What about this way here, the bypass? If we go through the bypass, bypass, that means you know if I'm here, okay. If I want to say something about here, which does not actually have a line number to correspond to it, if I want to say something about here, what what do you think has to be true? Pre two, pre two still has to be true because I don't have a chance to change anything yet at this point. So pre two has to maintain, you know, its truthfulness. But on top of that, I also can say something else, can't I? X is less than K. And not C. Well, in this general case, it's not C. In the specific case, then we can say X is less than K. Right. Right. Okay. So applying this template to our program, then we can say post 4 is basically post 3. Or... Okay, and then we spell out the other condition. Basically, in this case, it is pre-2, and it is not the case that x is greater than or equal to k. Now, it is true that you guys already know the answer. You, know, you already can spell out the entire answer. But to me, and also in your homework assignment, as well as the test, I want you guys to start with this. Because this one explains why it is the case. Because one way to get in here is through statement 3. The other one to come in here is not to go through statement three, which means pre two has to be true still because there's no I didn't have a chance to change anything. But at the same time, because I take, I take the bypass, it also means the condition of the conditional statement also has to be false. In other words, this line explains your rationale already. Now, after this line, you just expand everything, and then you get the answer. So in this case, I have post three or Pre two and x is less than zero. I'm doing some simplifications here, and we'll just go ahead and find out what is post three. Post three is simple. This mess here, and pre two is up there somewhere. And I performed the simplification, so it would be this guy here. Wait, is that true? It is. Okay. Just like that. Now, can we go for some simplifica simplifications? <laughs> Look at 